Live from KSAT 12, the news at noon starts right now. This noon, we are learning of a second San Antonio police officer who has tested positive for COVID-19. That's according to city officials. San Antonio Police Department says this case does not appear to be connected to the first case. City officials said this is second case is a detective who worked with SAPD for 15 years. The detective is recovering at home. Metro Health is investigating to find out how the officer contracted the virus. The first officer to have contracted the virus is a seven-year veteran of SAPD and is also recovering at home. Meantime, Wilson County reporting three more cases of coronavirus. That's according to the Wilson County News. There are now five confirmed cases in that county. Those with the three new cases are currently isolated in their homes. The Texas Department of State Health Services is helping Wilson County in identifying any close contact these patients may have had prior to getting tested positive. And Bear County has reported a total of 207 positive cases since the start of the pandemic. So far, nine people have died due to the virus and 154 remain ill. More than 50 people have been hospitalized and more than 40 people in San Antonio have survived their fight against the coronavirus. City officials say 21% of all cases, which is about 44 people, are considered fully recovered as of last night. The latest case numbers are released on the city's website every evening and we'll have the information for you during our 6 p.m. newscast. We are watching the stock market right now. Coronavirus concerns continue to affect it. Here's a look at the latest numbers. This morning, stocks started sinking again on Wall Street. The S&P 500 dropped roughly 3% this morning in trading. It happened after President Donald Trump warned the company to brace for the roughest two or three weeks we've ever had in our country, unquote. The selling on the stock market was widespread. All 11 sectors that make up the S&P 500 we're down. The coronavirus death toll projections are rising rapidly in the U.S. Government health officials now say anywhere from 100,000 up to a quarter of a million Americans could die from the COVID-19 pandemic if they follow strict social distancing rules. And if they don't, that number could rise into the millions. ABC's Andrew Dimbert is in Washington with the latest on the government's response to the pandemic. President Trump and his COVID-19 task force now with a grim outlook on the outbreak. I want every American to be prepared for the hard days that lie ahead. The president with a somber tone predicting a painful two weeks ahead for the nation. Top officials on his COVID-19 task force now believe as many as 240,000 people could die from the novel coronavirus, even following the administration's social distancing guidelines. They're very sobering. You know, when you see 100,000 people, that's at a, and that's at a minimum number. As health experts and federal leaders try to slow the spread. The Surgeon General telling Good Morning America the time for all Americans to wear masks in public could be imminent. We've asked the CDC to take another look at whether or not having more people wear masks will prevent transmission of the disease to other people. In an effort to curb the pandemic, the president has extended the administration's guidelines for social distancing until at least April 30th, but still refuses to issue a nationwide stay at home order, leaving it up to the state governments to decide. Unless we see something obviously wrong, we're going to let the governors do it. Meanwhile, the disconnect between states and the federal government on supplies is mounting. Some governors say they are short on critical COVID-19 equipment like masks and ventilators looking to the White House for guidance while bidding against one another for life-saving tools. We are paying $25,000 per ventilator and we are broke and the last thing I want to do is buy a single ventilator that I don't need. Meanwhile, as workers and business owners remain in their homes and without income, the deadly new reality is hitting along with the financial hardship they're suffering now that it's the first of the month and rents and mortgages are due. Currently laid off due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, worried about how to pay my April 1 rent. And lawmakers are already discussing another $2 trillion stimulus package, and the president says he wants it to focus on infrastructure. Andrew Dimber, ABC News, Washington. Back here in San Antonio, parents in Northeast ISD can now pick up meals without their children being present. It's an effort to make it easier for children to stay safe at home. Parents will need to show their child's birth certificate or school report card. 
According to NEISD's website, the program is open to all children, even if they don't attend schools in that district. Pickup times are every Monday through Friday from 1130 in the morning until 1:30 in the afternoon. Just go to KSAT.com for participating locations. While the United States continues its fight against the coronavirus, we're also facing medical supply shortages. With his shop closed for the moment, a local orthodontist is stepping up and helping out. Max Massey shows us how Dr. Bart Wilson is making his own face masks to donate to local health care workers on the front lines. At the end of the day, we've got to get beyond this. We've got to get beyond this, not only to open up our businesses, but to keep people healthy. These are the masks that Dr. Wilson of Mission Orthodontics has created. They are not FDA approved, but they are better than many alternatives. But the CDC says, if you don't have a mask, nothing's available to you. We want you to use a bandana or a scarf. Can you imagine being over a patient, intubating a patient that you know has the virus, wearing a bandana or a scarf? The plan is to donate these to nurses, doctors, and hospital workers locally who may have to deal with the virus face to face. We're not getting paid for this at all. In fact, we're covering the cost of the print and the materials and then we're donating them. Here's the breakdown of the process. It all starts with a 3D printer. Prints out and it's very hard. And then from there, this gets sent to me. Next up, the customized fit. So this is important to keep the air from flowing through and from that bacteria and the virus to getting in. That's exactly right. So even though we may have a really good filter in the front, if we do not have a proper fit around your eyes, the bridge of your nose and your face, you're going to be breathing in air from the outside. Then the filter gets put on top. So it's a HEPA filter. HEPA, H-E-P-A, filters out 99.97 uh, percent of the particles. Finally, the mask is zip tied, air sealed closed, and then with straps, they're good to go. Instead of having these surgical masks or maybe a typical N95 masks, this is the way of the future. And this will be what we face our next pandemic with across the board. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Interesting approach there. Today is National Census Day, and for weeks now, census questionnaires have been sent out to Americans by mail. It is a requirement by law that you need to answer the census, either by phone or to mail those back. For those who don't, census workers are expected to go door to door in the coming months, and that's an issue. Answering the census determines how many representatives in Congress each state will have. It also affects how much money federal money will go to local schools and infrastructure projects. If you'd like some more information on the census, just head over to KSET.com. New at noon, a cashier held up at gunpoint and now a crook is running free. Police tell us they're looking for this person. We're told the suspect walked into a Circle K in the 5900 block of Gibbs Sprawl Road back on March 19th. Officers say the person pulled out a gun and pointed it at the cashier, then demanded cash. The suspect ran off before police got to the scene, and now police are hoping you know something that can help them solve this case. If you have useful information, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. There is still talk in the NBA about cutting players' salaries since they are on hiatus. However, Blair Ramirez says a couple of Spurs may avoid that salary slice. And while many companies have struggled during the coronavirus pandemic, others are seeing an increase in their business. Up next, how a farm in Seguin is working hard to keep up with customers. Due to the precautions surrounding the coronavirus, some businesses have had to shut down entirely, while others, like local farms, are doing a lot more business. Some haven't had the luck of stocking their fridge with eggs, so they're going straight to the source, that farm. Alicia Barrera visited a family-owned farm in Seguin to find out how they're meeting this new demand. Directly off of one of the main roads in Seguin is Brownie Farms, a 50-acre farm harvested by a family of six. And we may see 150, 200 cars pass right by our farm stand and never stop one time to even check us out or see what we're about. But ever since the coronavirus pandemic hit, and we run a lot of late hours, business is booming for the Brownie family. We've had an outpouring of support, honestly, and I'm not quite sure if it's really supporting us other than we're supporting them because some people just really couldn't find the things that they needed in the stores. They have cabbage, broccoli, strawberries, and one of the most coveted items. We can't keep 
enough eggs. So many people are still looking for them. The chickens produce what they produce. If I had probably a million dozen, I could have sold them. I mean, people are just in, in need of eggs. With local farmers markets shut down because of COVID-19, the family has made really good use of their farm stand. It's open every Wednesday 1 to 7 p.m. and Saturdays 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. They also offer an option to shop online and subscribe for seasonal produce. Pull that weed. It's a job Julie and Jeffrey say they couldn't do without their kids or without the support from their customers. Their hope is for the world to recover from the deadly respiratory virus. Well, I'll tell you, it's pretty scary and we have conversations about the virus. And for their business to thrive for generations to come. I just hope they remember to continue to stop and continue to support their local farmers along with other small grocers and meat markets and things like that in the area. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. A lot of good going on there. Got those kids out of the house, working in the field, pulling weeds. Vitamin D. <laughs> Love that, and there's great weather for it. Yeah, kind of back to the basics, right? Yeah. Uh, outside right now, we've got uh, mostly clear skies. It is going to be a nice day today, but we're moving into a more active pattern. We're going to start to see some thunderstorms as early as tomorrow, but our best chance will be on Friday. The aquifer is down. We need some rain. Down four tenths of a foot to 670.6. In your pollen count, Oak is a little bit higher than it was yesterday in the high category, 5,720, but an improvement from those numbers we were seeing above 25,000 earlier this week. Mold, mulberry, pecan, all in the low category. We'll talk about that potential for maybe some stronger storms on Friday coming up. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather, streaming free on KSAT TV. A local photographer taking a closer look at what life in quarantine is like by snapping portraits of her neighbors. The portraits are a part of a new project she has started that shows how families are dealing with so much time together at home right now. It's been interesting in this unheard essay story. Photographer Pamela Broadman tells us why she started the project and gives us a look at some of her photos. posted a link uh, on Facebook asking if any of my neighbors would be interested in participating. Uh, everybody wanted to be part of it. Uh, I started this project just to allow families to have a chance to get dressed, uh, get out of the house. Some of them had a lot of fun with it. And, uh, I have 85 families scheduled for the two weeks. Uh, so far I've done 48 families. They are home together for the first time probably in years. They're spending so much time together and they have this opportunity to capture those moments. It's been amazing just getting to know them, meeting them. They just wanted to have capture those moments and uh, I was just glad to be there for them to do that. These will be memories, I tell you. Right now, Pamela is displaying the photos on her business Facebook page. However, she hopes to soon begin working on a coffee table book and have all of those photos included in it. If you'd like some more information about her story, just head over to the website, ksat.com. We are watching the weather. We are expecting rain again. I guess if you, Adam was telling me yesterday, be sure to weed and seed today because this yep. is your last day to do it before the rain comes. Very good advice. Uh, yes, the rain's going to start to kick in tomorrow. We have some chances. I think our best chance is probably Friday. And then from there on out, the, the rain chances stick around. So we have the potential to get some decent rainfall totals around here, which I don't think anyone will complain about. We just got to watch out for some of these stronger storms, and those may kick up on Friday. Let's first start with the lows this morning. We got down to 52 here in San Antonio, 48 New Braunfels, 48 in Fredericksburg. It was a really comfortable morning. We had the dry air in place, a few clouds out there. The sunrise, if you were able to catch it, was really nice too. Right now, a little bit of a breeze out there, 68 degrees southeasterly winds at around 11 miles per hour, and that is a important change because we had northwesterly winds to start. Now the winds are out of the southeast, and it's this number right here that's going to start to go up. Two point is at 51, and it'll probably stay comfortable through the afternoon. But tonight, the moisture really does start to increase, and tomorrow you'll notice it. The satellite picture shows we don't have much out there in the way of cloud cover, some thin high clouds working over Bear County right now. 
68 again at the airport, 70 in Castroville, 64 Bernie stage. We're sitting at 67 in Seguin. Uh, and some 70s down to the south, closing in on 80 there in Laredo, 73 right now in Del Rio. And some clouds starting to come in there out of the west. And it, overall, I think we'll see a little bit of an increase in high cloudiness uh, a little bit later today. High temperatures should be up around 79 degrees, and then we'll drop down into the low 70s by 8 o'clock. So here's that dew point increase I was talking about. Uh, yes, it's, it's okay right now, but as we get into the, this evening, we'll start to see dew points in the 60s uh, pick up here around the, the Gulf Coast. And then as we get closer into tomorrow morning, uh, those dew points will increase into the 60s everywhere. We'll start to feel somewhat muggy here around South Texas. That may lead to a little bit of morning drizzle, by the way. You can't rule that out. And then tomorrow afternoon, potential is there for a couple of isolated showers and storms. Here's the setup, and you can see some of those high clouds coming in from the west. There'll be some little disturbances in there. That will be one of the things that helps kick off some thunderstorms. But we also have a cold front off to our north. And this one is uh, pretty significant for this time of year. It's going to slide south. It'll be here by Friday. And timing is everything here. It looks like it'll be here Friday afternoon. And that would be uh, kick up the potential for uh, the storms, and some of which could be strong. So that's what we're going to have to watch. But there is the storm system there, and the cooler air is behind it. Eight degrees right now in Cup Bank. So there is uh, certainly a kick to this front as it uh, moves off to the south. Here's the future cast and it does show that by tomorrow afternoon we can see some isolated showers and storms out ahead of a, a dry line and we'll see quite a bit of cloud cover tomorrow. And then as we get into Friday, here comes the front and showers and storms developing right along that front. And if, again, a few of those could be strong to severe. Uh, the risk is there, slight risk on a scale of one to five. We're talking about a two here, and the threats really would be uh, wind and hail and, and maybe some flooding, too. There could be some pockets of heavy rain here. There's enough moisture in the atmosphere uh, for that to happen. So we'll be keeping an eye on all of that for you. Forecast for tomorrow, 74, 30% chance of showers and storms, but we up to a 60% chance on Friday, 50% chance on Saturday and then some more storms possible Sunday and even into next week. So the pattern stays active. Temperatures stay in the 70s for the most part, guys. All right. Thank you so much, Justin. Of course, they're talking in the NBA about cutting these guys salaries because they're not playing. And that would that would hurt a lot of these guys, wouldn't it? Yeah, you mm -hmm. know, but probably a lot of people don't feel too, too sorry for them, I guess, no. because a lot of them are millionaires, but still, that's their job, and they want to get paid. Well, these players will have, some of them anyway, will have a new job coming up. 16 of them will take place in an NBA 2K tournament. So if you're Jones and for some basketball, this could be for you. And speaking of NBA's regular season, Jeff Van Gundy isn't so sure the season will resume. Coming up. I'm with Jeff. The NBA and the NBA Players Association are discussing ways to dock players pay and put the money in a league escrow should regular season games eventually be canceled, as reported by ESPN. The collective bargaining agreement maintains that players lose approximately 1% of salary per canceled game based on a force majeure provision, which covers several catastrophic circumstances, including epidemics and pandemics. But Mark Stein of the New York Times reports that two Spurs, DeJounte Murray and Trey Lyles, will still get paid as NBA games are not being played due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Stein reported that players receive paychecks Wednesday but have not been confirmed of further payments. Stein says that while roughly 90% of players have received less than half their salaries for the season due to being on 12-month payment plans, nine players represented by Clutch Sports will have received more than 90% of their salary by April 1st, including Murray and Lyles. Still, Stein says that select group of NBA players who have already received the vast majority of their 2019-20 salaries would eventually have to make paybacks through a different mechanism likely funds withheld from next season's contract. Now, last night, the Spurs were supposed to be wrapping up their last long road trip in Sacramento against the Kings before beginning the final month of the regular season. Starting today, they would have had eight games, eight games left in the regular season, scheduled for to end April 15th against the Pelicans. Now, the Spurs are hoping that when the season does resume, that there will be time given for the Silver and Black to have a chance to catch Memphis for the eighth and final playoff spot in 
the Western Conference. Virtual reality racing is a big hit for NASCAR, so an NBA 2K tournament should also do well. Kevin Durant and Trey Young will lead a 16-player field of NBA players in the NBA 2K20 tournament that will air on ESPN. It begins Friday and will run through April 11th from the comfort of their homes, according to reports. The winner of the competition will receive a $100,000 donation to a coronavirus-related effort. KD, who had to sit out this season with a torn Achilles, is the number one seed, and he will face 16th seeded Derrick Jones in round one. Some positive news coming out of the NBA. All members of the LA Lakers are symptom free. This comes just two weeks after two unnamed players tested positive for COVID-19. The Lakers had their players tested immediately after four members of the Brooklyn Nets, including Durant, tested positive for the virus. And the last game the Lakers played before the NBA shutdown was against the Nets. 14 of the Lakers 17 man roster, including two way contracts were tested at the time. And NBA analyst Jeff Van Gundy believes the season is over with. During an appearance on a Portland radio show, Van Gundy says he believes the rest of the NBA season will be canceled and he adds the 2020 Major League Baseball season will follow suit and at the very least football will be delayed. The NBA has been very vocal on the fact they want to resume the season at some point even without fans perhaps. But now that social distancing guidelines are extended through the end of this month, it is not looking good. And Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban, who thought it would start in mid-May earlier today, said now he's not sure when and if the season will resume. And of course, they got to worry about the beginning of next season. And if they try to do something this year, how far does it push next season back? Exactly. There's a lot of stuff on the yeah. table right now. Got a lot of things to worry about. Of course, we'll worry about the COVID virus first. And yep. We'll take care of that later. All right, Larry. Hey, it's hard to show your appreciation for people while practicing social distancing. Still ahead, what New Yorkers are doing to thank their health care workers. We want to get you to some late breaking news. The San Antonio Fire Department holding a press conference at the San Antonio Emergency Operations Center. Right now, we don't have a lot of information, but the city did tweet out that there is an apparent COVID-19 outbreak at a local nursing home. We are uh, waiting uh, to see the emergency management uh, folks to begin speaking. Let's go to that uh, live news conference right now where the fire chief, Charles Hood, is expected to speak. We're hearing a, a number of rumors that there has been a case at a local nursing home, uh, but we're still awaiting all the details. You know, that is one of the fears across the country. Obviously, one of the hot spots that started with coronavirus, COVID-19 deaths came in Kirkland uh, in Washington State at a a, a uh, senior citizens nursing home there, and that began with uh, with the coronavirus, coronavirus going across the country. Over 20 people have died in that nursing home. And then, of course, there was another nursing home in California where over 50 people have passed away. So those nursing homes are uh, one of those hot spots that uh, people really in the uh, health department are really worried about. There was also a nursing home in the New Orleans area that was expected to have spawned off uh, several hundred cases of coronavirus. Obviously, there's a lot of high contact in nursing homes, and that's the problem is that you're in a situation where there are a lot of people in a small area that need a lot of care from a lot of personnel. So uh, when you have one case in one nursing home, uh, you can expect that they're going to have a serious situation on their hands. Again, we are waiting. Uh, the fire chief Charles Hood at the emergency management uh, offices there in San Antonio to begin speaking and explain what exactly the situation is. We can tell you that right now the city of San Antonio is keeping a pretty rapid count on how many cases are going on uh, in our city, how many deaths, and we're, we're being kept up to date a lot more transparently now. Uh, this news conference perhaps a sign of that, that they're not going to be holding back as much information as perhaps uh, we've been seeing uh, early on when this virus first began being an issue. Waiting on Charles Hood and also uh, we've just been told that's a, a member of the San Antonio Metro Health Department will also be there to uh, 
give us some information during this press conference. That's one of the things that our governor, Greg Abbott, has always emphasized through all, all his press conference is, and one of the things, one of the rules that he has laid down is no visitors to nursing homes in the state of Texas. And this is one of the reasons why, as you mentioned, it's easy to, to spread the COVID-19 when you're in such close contact. And of course, the most vulnerable among us are the older people in our community. And that's what they're trying to avoid right now. But unfortunately, as we understand it, there has been an outbreak at a local nursing home, once again, waiting on Charles Hood and a member of the Metro Health Department to come talk to us. We do uh, have a up-to-date uh, count on the cases here in San Antonio. City officials, as of now, reporting uh, there are nine COVID-19 deaths so far in the, in the city. 63 of those travel-related, 63 community transmission cases and 54 cases still under investigation. Let's go now to Fire Chief Charles Hood. My name is Fire Chief Charles Hood. I am part of the uh, Unified Command. Um, starting on March 21st and culminating yesterday, the San Antonio Fire Department and Metro Health were made aware of an outbreak of COVID-19 within the Southeast Nursing and Rehabilitation Center located at 4302 South Cross. Working with STRAC, and MedCom, we were able to recognize that a total of six patients have been transported via private ambulance and San Antonio Fire Department units. As today, a total of 12 individuals have tested positive for COVID-19. Six of them are staff members and six are residents. All remaining residents were tested yesterday and a total of 74 tests are awaiting results at this time. Unfortunately, one of yesterday's reported deaths was a resident from this facility. Knowing that this could be a reality within these vulnerable populations, within nine days of the first positive at a life care facility in Kirkland, Washington, uh, San Antonio Fire Department and Bear County ESD and ambulance partners, we visited all nursing homes within our region. Within San Antonio, we have 68 nursing home facilities. Our fire companies uh, went to each one of them and uh, gave them information about potential spread of COVID-19. We worked with the uh, responsible parties to make sure that we had the best ingress and egress to those facilities to where we're not exposing our crews or the patients as far as moving patients out. So it was one of the, uh, the key things that we noticed that happened in Kirkland and we wanted to protect our most vulnerable populations here. In the days following this reported concentrated outbreak, the San Antonio Fire Department and Metro Health, we work close with the facility to instruct them on proper uh, cleaning, sterilization, and uh, of their building. We've also done multiple classes on uh, PPE donning, which is putting it on, and doffing, as well as supplying them with one week of supply of PPE. Going forward, San Antonio Fire Department Dispatch will continue to monitor transports from nursing facilities and transport decisions will be closely monitored by our regional medical directors. So what that means is we noticed uh, increase in transportations, hospital transportations out of a nursing home. We'll continue to monitor increased transports out of nursing homes in this region, whether it's a private ambulance company or the San Antonio Fire Department to look at trigger points to where we may need to address those as a potential hotspot. Um, we did go in and uh, look at their PPE, provided them more PPE. The health Department went in and did some sterilization work. And again, the um, nursing home has been um, very helpful, cooperative throughout. We are not looking to take over any nursing home in this region but we do want to take care of our most vulnerable populations and we will continue to monitor any nursing home in this region as far as increased activity as far as transports. Our regional medical directors are working on plans to where um, the hospital, or, I'm sorry, the nursing home would call uh, for instructions on whether to transport or not. Our goal is to transport those that need to be transported but again, if we can keep those in the facilities, that's what we want to do. So I have no doubt that what occurred over the last couple of days with the work with this nursing home and the partners in this region that we potentially save lives. 
So I'll stand by to take any questions that you may have. Chief, when you said March 21st, that was the first case in this nursing home? It was the first transport. We didn't notice cases. We were looking at transports. Okay. Do you, so at what point did you all realize that this was a hot spot and that there was a, there was a cluster here? You know what? We looked at, we had probably five or six calls that came out in probably a 12-hour period to where it was a trigger for us. And that was something that we had discussed early on. And so it's... Um, Having the Lackland experience has given us a head start on most fire departments, most emergency operations centered around the country because it was a concern of ours a couple of months ago as far as we need to get out to the nursing homes. Um, I got a vested interest because I have a relative that lives in a nursing home, and it breaks my heart that I can't go see him now. But again, it is for his protection. It's protection of everyone there and our first responders because we do go to nursing homes <coughs> on an everyday occurrence. But if we see an uptick in calls from a facility, that will be a concern for us. How, what kind of precautions have the nursing home taken before this? I think by March 21st, all, several orders had come out. Um, I believe we've been seeing a lot of nursing homes even start to limit visitors before then. So can you tell us about what they had already taken and how, and how this might have happened despite precautions? I will jump to your second question first, and so part of the information that we sent out when we visited with a fire truck or, an, or a fire truck or a ladder truck, when we visited, we gave them specific information about visitations, about separating their, their clientele. As far as what this particular nursing home had did beforehand, I, I'm not really, I, I can't really answer that question. Have you seen any other clusters or hotspots in other nursing homes? Um, you know, thank God at this time we have not. And again, if we would address something like that, you would know. But this is the first time that we have had to respond in this such nature. And so as soon as we found out that there was a threat, we were out there in about two hours with a team from Mobile Integrated Healthcare and from our public health folks and the private ambulance company. So we sent a team out really quick, but this is the only one that we have had. My understanding is that every resident has been tested. Does that include? staff as well? I might have that. Every resident has been tested. We're working on testing the remaining staff at this time. Those tests that were done for the residents, uh, we're hoping for a 48-hour or less turnaround. So we're going to fast track those tests because, again, we want to know that information. It sounds like this is the first, uh, this is the first we're hearing of a hotspot of any kind in the community. Can you talk about, uh, can you talk to some of the people out there who might for the first time be realizing how serious this can get. Yeah, you know what? Um, I think every time that we get up there, uh, we get up here and we share information with you, it's a chance to provide public safety information to the residents. And for those of the, those of that are listening to this that have relatives in nursing homes, that have elderly relatives, friends, uh, we have to protect them. They are the most vulnerable population. And so um, you can't go to a nursing home and visit. You can't take food like you normally do. You can't take cigarettes like I normally did. All of those things that we used to do with our elder populations, we have to really consider them right now, protect them by staying away from them as much as we can, letting the nursing home facilities take care of those folks, and hopefully when this slows down, then we can go to back to some type of normalcy with our visits and our relationships with our elderly relatives that are in facilities such as this. No, the case numbers that you saw yesterday included this gentleman in that case number. How and when were the families notified? How and when were the families notified? Yeah. I have no idea. You'd have to talk to the nursing home on that issue. Any other questions? Thanks for your time. Appreciate you. You've been listening to Fire Chief uh, Charles Hood. He had a lot of information.
all of it. Breaking news, an outbreak at a local nursing home. Uh, one person has died, but they have uh, a number of positive cases there. Six patients uh, uh, testing positive, six staff members at Southeast Nursing and Rehabilitation Center testing positive as well. Yes, uh, Rehabilitation Center located on East South Cross. They have 74 Wait, they're waiting on the results from 74 different tests, and he said that all the folks at this particular nursing home have been tested, and they have visited all the nursing homes in San Antonio, 68 of them. Firefighters have been to each one of those nursing homes, and they've been instructing the folks there at these nursing homes on how to take care of these patients. And they, once again, Chief Hood emphasizing do not visit any relatives or any friends in these nursing homes because now we see how vulnerable they are. That's right. I have parents in an in, uh, independent living facility. There's no one in, no one out, and that's how it should be. Uh, Chief Hood said that they realized they had a problem when they received about five or six calls from the same rehabilitation nursing home uh, there on South Cross. They realized something was going on there, and he said they were on the scene with a team within two hours uh, and began assessing a situation that is, we now know, is an outbreak of the coronavirus. Uh, he did say that they did provide more PPE that's that protective uh, uh, gear that is required for people to wear around COVID-19 patients. They made more PPE available at that nursing home and did some sterilization work. But this is the kind of uh, education and demonstration that the fire department apparently is doing at all the nursing homes here in San Antonio. Uh, this one, though, suffering an outbreak and even a death at this point. One thing he did emphasize was they learned so much from the folks at Lackland. Remember, we had the uh, all those folks come out off of that ship that ended up here in San Antonio and they were over there being quarantined at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland. He said they learned a lot from that experience and that helped them prepare for for this experience, which he said they were able to get over there within two hours and uh, help those folks at this nursing home. Once again, it's the Southwest Nursing Home and Rehab Facility on East South Cross that they've had these uh, this outbreak of COVID-19. All right, so we have six patients, six staff members testing positive there, a total of 12 positive cases at that particular nursing home. Of course, the city will have another news conference later on today. We expect to get an update on all of the numbers, and uh, we are going to continue and have more news after this.